Sick of coronavirus rules, tens of thousands defy social gathering bans in Europe to protest against measures designed to control the pandemic. With cooler weather on the way, how should we balance personal rights while reducing new infections? This is Inside Story. Hello there, welcome to the programme. I'm Hala Mahiedin. Restrictions meant to help stop the spread of COVID-19 are not going away anytime soon. As governments ease lockdowns, they've imposed safety measures like mandatory face coverings and social distancing. But people are growing increasingly frustrated with those rules. In Europe, tens of thousands of protesters have defied bans on mass gatherings. The so-called anti-corona rallies attracted conspiracy theorists, anti-vaccine campaigners, as well as far-left and far-right groups who say the measures violate personal freedoms. But government leaders insist the restrictions must stay in place, especially as cooler months approach in the Northern Hemisphere. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment, but first this report from Dominic Kane in Berlin, where the biggest march took place on Saturday. For weeks, the daily number of new coronavirus infections in Germany has been rising. Yet for these people in Berlin, what matters most is their right not to observe any restrictions, not to wear masks, not to follow social distancing, and to show their anger at the politicians who have imposed them. Die ganze Regierung ist illegal, alles ist illegal. The whole government is illegal, everything is illegal, and Corona is just a medium to heavy flu, a pandemic that is being used to enslave us humans. That view is not shared by the police, who tried and failed twice on Friday to persuade the courts to ban the demonstration, saying that protesters posed a serious risk. These are people that we can assume as coronavirus skeptics have taken no precautions in recent months. In a time when infection numbers are increasing, we don't believe these gatherings to be responsible. The protesters are made up of many different groups, some from the political far left of society, some from the far right. What unites them is a sense of injustice and rights being lost. Demonstrations like these pose this country's politicians a serious ethical dilemma, forcing them to balance on the one hand the rights of individuals to protest against government measures with which they disagree, and on the other hand, the rights of the wider community to be protected as far as possible from the risk of coronavirus infection. It's a risk, ministers say, is growing. The problem is, it is too früh too hoch. The problem is the numbers are too high too early, given that winter is coming and we don't currently know what effect it will have and how the flu and other illnesses will affect it. The numbers are too high at this early stage. That's why the authorities have tried so hard to prevent scenes like these and why they are so fearful of what effect so many people might have when they're in such close proximity to each other without masks. Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera, Berlin. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our guests. All of them are in the UK today. In London, we have Heidi Larson, Director of the Vaccine Confidence Project and Professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. In Bath, Dr. Bharat Pankania, he's a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School and a specialist on emergency preparedness for outbreaks and pandemics. And also in London, we have Donna Dawson, a psychologist specialising in personality and behaviour. A warm welcome to all three of you. Let's start with you, Professor Larson. Given the scenes that we've seen in Germany, can you blame people for, for, for taking to the streets and for being sick of these restrictions? Because this pandemic has been going on now for, for months and there doesn't appear to be an end in sight. Well, I, I certainly empathise with the frustration um, by many people in the public about this extenuated um, lockdowns and, and mask wearing and social distancing. Um, quarantines are coming back. Um, but that's partly be 
because people have uh, let their guard down, as it were, thinking things were getting better. Um, the story of the, I mean, this has been embraced. It's interesting that it's both the extreme left and the extreme right. In our vaccine confidence research, we've seen a trend over the last five, 10 years of the, the vaccine sentiments, which is another dimension of the current protests are these anti-vaccine uh, groups, um, that they're becoming increasingly polarized. Uh, and this has become highly politicized. And there has been from the beginning with vaccine, certainly, and it's relevant here, a tension between my individual right and a public health right. Um, so I, I empathize with the frustration. Uh, it's, it's difficult, though, when uh, a, the behavior of a group like this really has a, an absolutely serious risk to the rest of the public. It does indeed. I, I see you nodding along there, Dr. Pankani. Uh, the, you specialise in outbreaks and pandemics. Of course, you must be concerned when you see crowds of 18,000 people who are protesting against these restrictions. But again, as someone who was in a lockdown for around five months, I mean, I got pretty sick of it. You can't blame these people. I mean, how long are people supposed to be locked down in their homes and unable to travel to work for there doesn't appear to be an end in sight at this point. Thank you. I'm very disappointed. I feel very sad. Uh, Germany has had an exemplary record in managing the coronavirus, COVID-19 disease and pandemic. They have done a wonderful job in Europe. And therefore, I feel even more sad that in the summer months, where people have got frustrated and they've decided that they will drop their guard. Uh, the case numbers have gone down, therefore the pandemic has gone and that they can do as they wish. This is a failure of communication. I feel really disappointed because what we ought to have continued is uh, visual, written, uh, uh, voice, messages continuously, not propaganda, pure signs to show to people that the virus is still here, it is still circulating, it is causing illness, and people, if they drop their guard, like we see in these pictures, they will get infected and some of them will die. Uh, I think this is a failure of communication. It's a great pity. In terms of, perhaps this is a failure of communication, but again, I point to the longevity of this. Uh, Donna Dawson, you, you specialise in, in personality behaviour, and certainly from the UK government's response, they were very, very reluctant to impose uh, full lockdown measures because they were worried about how long people would be able to keep up the, these, to, to live under these sorts of restrictions. Do you think the UK government might have been vindicated in some way, given these scenes? We're five, six months down the track now. People are sick of it and the virus still hasn't gone away. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic when they were doing daily briefings from number 10, there was one scientist that said, this is going to go on for a very long time. Um, he was rather muted and kept in the background, but it, it rung a bell with me. And in hindsight, it looks as though pure fear can motivate people for about two months. Um, but about after six months, people's behavior begins to resort back to uh, self-interest. There's a very fine line between self-preservation and community uh, thoughtfulness or community uh, survival. And we're at a tipping point now. It seems to me that more and more of those under 40 and particularly those under 30 are deciding that they are no longer vulnerable because there has been um, a gradual easing of some restrictions. And um, with the typical immortality that you think they have, they've, they've gone about their business in a kind of um, almost a retaliatory way to make up for lost time. So you've got a split now. You've got younger people who think they're fine, they're OK, their rights should no longer be impinged on. And you've got older people and those who are more anxious and with mental health issues who are getting more and more paranoid. And the, the two sets of people are getting more polarised. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is quite problematic. And as we sail into winter, I do wonder what's going to happen, particularly when unemployment figures start to go up and the money the government is paying out for those who are out of work 
dries up. I, I think we're going to see more rebellion and more individuals taking further action, but other groups of people who have been shielding will become more paranoid and, and more isolated. So this is what I'm expecting to see. It's, it's a fairly grim picture all three of you present here, and that does kind of run counter to a lot of the measures, that a lot of the communications we get from governments. There's a lot of emphasis in Europe of trying to open up, restore tourism, and certainly put some weight behind the economy. Now, those economic concerns, they also have public health implications as well in terms of the, the mental health impact of people who aren't working, uh, not to mention the children who live in abusive households, the uh, vulnerable people uh, who, who, who need to get out of their house to a safe space. Do you think there has... Uh, let, let me turn to, to you, Dr Pankaria. Do you, uh, Pankani, I beg your pardon. Do you think that we've been focused too much on COVID and less on the secondary impacts which can be every bit as dangerous if not more dangerous in the way that governments have tackled this pandemic yes i think both issues are very important and they have to be tackled at the same time i'm very concerned just as our psychology colleague has just said that with poverty with loss of employment we expect a storm of disquiet and disruption to follow. When people lose their jobs and livelihood and they've got very little to lose, you find that they don't wish to be part of uh, a, a community that is asking them to behave in a certain way. Therefore, I feel you do not plan in September for September. You need to be planning ahead and be aware that what is coming and put in control measures now. Even now is not too late because in about two to three months time, when all the benefits and all the support systems have gone and people have lost their livelihoods, I expect a winter of discontent. Therefore, it would be better to get the communications right now and communicate it. And, and really, we, this is a completely new way of living and we've got to change. We've got to sort of say, we are going to be poor as a result of economic decline and shutdown. We've got a virus that is circulating. Now we've got to have a solution and we've got to have a consistent solution for all members of society. It has to be done. Well, this is a very depressing message to bring people who've already had a fairly depressing 2020 on the whole. Uh, Professor Larson, how, how do you see... Do you see there's any hope on the horizon? Certainly people are investing a lot of stock in the, the, the possibility of a vaccine. Is a vaccine the way out of this crisis? Well, I think, I think we've got a, a few different measures and uh, the vaccine is the one intervention that will, uh, has the potential to get us out of the current situation of, of lockdown and, and masking. But I think what the, the reality is, one, we don't have a vaccine yet, um, but we do need a, a mix of interventions. And, and I think that, one, we do have time before we get a vaccine proven uh, safe and effective. A number of them look quite prom promising. Um, we need to use that time to build their confidence in it. To, uh, and I think that for some people who might not, who might have their otherwise hesitations about vaccine, when it comes to a situation where getting a vaccine can let you go back to work, let you go back to school, let you travel again, their decision factors are going to be different. So I think that there is hope. I think that that is you know, the light on the horizon, as it were. But in the meanwhile, um, we, there, we've had kind of extreme measures of either total masking, distancing, lockdown, uh, and no work, or, or, the, um, or opening things up uh, to help the economy along and, and psychology, frankly. Um, but we have to do a better job of bringing it back in the middle. I ironically, these extremists who, you know, want to say, stop all this masking, stop all this social distancing, are also say, are also interfering with actually what could be you know, a better approach to getting things back on track, which is to do it safely. Well, and I think that we need to shift our our lens there and 
do that. In the meanwhile, preparing for a vaccine, and and there we will get through this. But where does this come from? Because we say it's extremists who are against masking and who are against vaccines, but the the state epidemi epidemiologist in Sweden is against masks in public. So, and, and from the, the layman's perspective, yeah. when you have so many experts saying masks are good for you, and then another one says masks are not good for you, who do, who do people listen to? Well, it's a good point. And I, I, perhaps the, I should say some who have extreme views. I mean, in the, in the protests that we've been seeing, some of the sentiments that are coming out it, are more extreme, but there are a number of, of levels of people's, um, both what they are, their calculated decision, they don't think it's worth, um, they don't think they need to use a mask in certain settings, so they don't think, you know, the distancing is, and it is confusing. One place says two meters, one place, a World Health Organization says, you know, one thing, the government says another, you go into another, a third country, and that gives another 18, you know, instead of, it's like one and a half meters. Um, so it is confusing. And I think people have to also use their common sense. I mean, uh, these are not, I mean, ironically, things like masking and social distancing, people can own some of the resistance to vaccines is they feel like it's coming from an elite science. They're not clear. You know, they don't feel like they know enough about the process. Um, okay. Somebody else is injecting them. But we have an opportunity with these interventions to be publicly owned. OK, uh, let me turn to you, Donna Dawson. I, I want to get your take on this. Why do you think we are seeing a lot more pushback from people about wearing masks, you know, because well, there are a lot of scientists who say, look, this helps. So why yeah, are we seeing this pushback from people? It, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, because there's too much inconsistency, even within one government. The UK government itself has made many U-turns, has given rules without clarity, um, hasn't added to them, um, hasn't explained things fully enough. And people start then reading between the lines and saying, well, if they don't know what they're doing or they appear not to know what they're doing, I will use my common sense and make my own decisions. Um, we need more clarity. And when we talk about communication, that's communication from the top down. The government being very clear. I mean, a lot of people will laugh and joke about we're not allowed to um, integrate with more than uh, two family bubbles. And yet we can sit on an airplane next to somebody or we can go to the pub, but we can't socially distance very effectively in a theater. So there's too many inconsistencies and people are saying, well, this doesn't make any sense. The other thing that I think is happening is the virus has become slightly unreal to most of us. If you don't know somebody who's been very ill or died from it, it doesn't seem real. You can't see it. You, you can't put your finger on it. Um, and what I would like to see is um, maybe some more testimonials from people of all age groups uh, saying what their experience has been with the virus. Because uh, uh, this idea that it's just a small flu bug that you know you can you can get over. There are too many people that have suffered a long time with it, and there seem to be some long-lasting effects afterwards. I'd like to see more of that on the news. Maybe a little healthy dose of fear would, would go a long way because people have lost that now. They seem to think that uh, with the easing down of some restrictions, everything's OK. And because they don't have this virus around them, it somehow has disappeared. And of course, this is human nature again. If it doesn't affect you directly um, and it's not in your way, then you're going to ignore it or step over it. Dr. Pankani, is this something you agree with, that we need more fear in the middle of this deadly global pandemic where we've all been terrified? I agree, and the messaging should be consistent. We don't want to fear people, but as I said earlier, if, it, if you don't see a ill people, person, you don't see a damaged person following the infection, then you think this is all made up stuff. And what is really uh, coming out and clear to me is the level of education and the ability of people to work it out for themselves. What is safe? What causes the infection? How to protect myself? How to prevent myself getting infected? There is such a lack of people being able to work it out for themselves. We've got to do it for themselves. But then we've got to do it consistently and properly and, and repeat it. Furthermore, we were talking about vaccines a minute ago. 
I do not think the vaccine is the answer. Because even if we successfully find a vaccine, what we should be really doing is prevention. How did these novel viruses arise? We need to spend millions in preventing the emergence of new viruses. If we don't, 10, 15, 20 years from here, we will be back again discussing a new pandemic, which we could have prevented. So we really need, we need to plan and prepare and work on the prevention of new viruses emerging. In the meantime, have your consistent messages and you've got to repeat them because people say, I don't see it, therefore it is not there. But it, a lot of this also depends on where you get your consistent messages from. And this ties into the debate around vaccines because let's face it, there is a debate about vaccines. And certainly with va a vaccine being talked up before the US presidential election or a vaccine being released in Russia, uh, a lot of people are going to be quite skeptical of this. So perhaps a vaccine may not be a solution, but a lot of countries are, are pinning their hopes on one. Uh, so Professor Larson, given the, the, the scepticism and the lack of trusts right now around vaccines, which is being amplified during these uh, marches that we're seeing in places like Germany, there's also marches in the UK. Uh, how, do we, how do you win back the trust of people that vaccines and treatments are effective? Well, I, I agree uh, on the point that we need to um, build much more awareness about the scope and scale of, of this disease so that people actually believe that COVID exists and that they're at risk. Because if they don't have that, they're not going to be interested in a vaccine. But in terms of the safety and the, and the effectiveness of the vaccine, one of the big anxieties now is that people keep hearing it's fast, you know, it's everything from warp speed to the first one there. And to scientists, perhaps, and certainly to politicians, fast is good. To the public, fast means they're taking shortcuts. It's not going to be safe. Uh, it's too risky. So I think we need to use this time to build much more awareness about the fact that they're not faster because we're shortcutting an old process. These are new technologies. They're new opportunities. Um, we haven't really explained why things are faster. We have a new financing mechanism. We didn't have, for instance, for Ebola, and it was set up because of Ebola. So okay. there was money there to fund. Okay. So... I think that we have time. Let's use it. OK, we're, we're in the dying minutes of this debate, so I'm going to put the same question to all three of you, and if you could answer it as briefly as possible. Are you hopeful that 2021 will be better? Because let's face it, 2020 hasn't been anything to write home about. Let me start with you, Donna Dawson. I think we have to have some hope that we've learned some lessons from this year. We, we may not like what we have to do, and we may find it boring and tedious and, and a bit scary. We're going to have to make major long-term behavioral changes. We're going to have to get into some habits that persist, and that is about not just looking after ourselves and our immediate family, but thinking of the person next to us, our neighbors, our communities. We're going to have to think about protecting them as well. We're going to have to use our common sense. Uh, and we're going to have to think about trying to return slowly to what we, we used to know as, as our lifestyle okay. with some measures of protection. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pankania. Your thoughts? Well, if we endure the pain properly in 2020, 2021 may be better. And I want people to look at it as if we endure the pain of 2020, 2021 will be better. Failure to do that will equal 2021 also gets rubbed off. So okay. let us work hard, work hard now for tomorrow, a better tomorrow. Thank you very much. And the final 20 seconds are yours, Professor Larson. Yes, I am hopeful for 2021. Uh, there may be a vaccine which will certainly change the picture. I think we will be at a different stage of the epidemic. It'll be a difficult time economically as we recover, but I'm really hopeful that we'll be in, in a better place in 2021. Okay, so difficult times ahead, but hope 
prevails. Thank you very much indeed to all my guests, Professor Heidi Larson, Dr. Bharat Pankania and Donna Dawson. And thank you too for watching at home. Remember, you can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, head to our social media. We have Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Join the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story or tweet me directly at Halat Mohideen. But for me and the entire team here in Doha, it's bye for now.